Previously on Sailing Avocet. Handy landing. Aquatic Park Cove is a human-made urban harbor that mimics a natural anchorage. Built in 1929, the Aquatic Pier was designed to create a protected cove, offering a safe area for recreational swimming, sailing, and rowing, with a beautiful backdrop of one of San Francisco's most prominent city fronts. So the tide apparently can whip through here pretty violently, so we've been told to keep a lot of room, not only for the wind, but also for the tide, because when it goes out of the gate, you're going to go towards the east side of the, of the entrance or the harbor, and then obviously when it comes in, you're going to go towards the west. So. Just give yourself lots of room. It's not an anchorage you want to mess with when it comes to tide. Fortunately, we were only one of two boats in the anchorage, and most of the swimmers stuck closer to shore, for the time being anyways. With the anchor set in a comfortable 15 feet of water with 7 to 1 scope, we kicked back to enjoy our new digs. Good morning, everyone. We are here at Aquatic Park, which is right outside Ghirardelli Square. And today we are going to Alcatraz, which is why Chris is making me eat before we leave because he knows that with all the walking and ghost hunting I'll be doing, um, I will get hangry. So he doesn't leave me on the island, he's making me eat. Since Aquatic Park is full of swimmers, rowers, and paddle boarders, it is a motor-free zone, meaning it is a refuge for us sailors. With that said, dinghies are permitted to use outboards under five horsepower to get to and from shore. Although our dinghy winglet is equipped with a two horsepower Yamaha, we opted to row instead. That's where we're headed. So the beach we just came up to is the National Park Beach, so I don't think that there's actually public access here and especially after hours, this place closes. So I just talked to David, who is Harbor Master, and he gave us the number to get back in. Um, so I think we're gonna leave the dinghy how it is. It's locked to a tree, so I think it'll be all right. But uh, if you're on the other side of these two piers, that is the public beach, and that is what I've heard can be difficult when it comes to people trying to steal dinghies and stuff like that. If you're gonna stay here overnight, you need to have a permit, and it's $10 a night. After a lot of the anchor rounds got pushed out of Richardson Bay, a lot of them came here. So it's a new thing that you have to pay here. Um, so anyways, you can do it online, but the website, as even the Harbor Master just said, is pretty janky. It's made for campsites, not anchorages. So we're gonna hopefully pay in person right now with this uh, ticket boost. With the permit in hand, we were all set and ready to continue on with our day. From Aquatic Cove, it was an eight minute walk along the Embarcadero to Alcatraz Landing on Pier 33, where the ferry picked us up along with the other island goers. We purchased our tickets online, but you can also buy your tickets there at the pier before boarding the ferry for the 15 minute ride across to the rock. Alcatraz Island, known simply as Alcatraz or The Rock, was a maximum security federal prison located on the tiny island off the coast of San Francisco. Prior to becoming one of the most notorious prisons in history, the site was the most powerful military fort west of the Mississippi in the 1850s. The army recognized that the cold water and swift currents surrounding the island made it an ideal site for a prison, and in 1861, the post was designated as a military prison for the Department of the Pacific. Ironically, while built to guard against foreign invasion, Alcatraz's most important military period was during the Civil War. Since it was the only completed fort in the Bay Area, it was vital in protecting San Francisco from the Confederate raiders. During the next three decades, additional buildings were built to contain up to 150 army prisoners. Eventually, a prison stockade known as the Upper Prison was hastily built on the parade ground, and by 1902, there were 461 prisoners on the island. With modern weaponry making Alcatraz obsolete as a fort, the Army dropped plans to mount new guns and instead designated the island as the Pacific Branch U.S. Military Prison in 1907. Work began the following year on the cell house, which still stands today. Completed in 1912 with 600 single cells, the cell house was the largest reinforced concrete building in the world. Shortly after, in 1915, Alcatraz was changed from a military prison to Pacific Branch U.S. Disciplinary Barracks. 
The new name reflected the growing emphasis on rehabilitation as well as punishment. During the Great Depression, military budgets were cut and the Army was considering closing the disciplinary barracks, a perfect opportunity to fulfill the Justice Department's desire to open a super prison to house incorrigible prisoners. Negotiations moved rapidly and the Department of Justice acquired the barracks on October 12, 1933. Given the high security and the island's location, prison operators believed Alcatraz to be America's strongest prison and escape proof until three men made the impossible happen, and to this day, the case on their disappearance is ice cold. Something I failed to realize prior to our visit was that Alcatraz was only in operation for 29 years, closing on March 21, 1963. Contrary to rumors, it didn't close because of the aforementioned escapees, but because the institution was too expensive to continue operating, which makes sense given the environment the prison found itself in. We wandered through each cell block, following the cell phone audio tour's careful directions, doing our best to preserve a bit of personal space amongst the sluggish and overwhelming crowd. The three-story cell house included the four main cell blocks, as well as the warden's office, visitation room, the library, barber shop, and the mess hall. I wasn't expecting luxury by any means, but I was surprised to see that the prison cells typically measured nine by five with a seven foot headroom. They were primitive and lacked privacy, furnished with a bed, desk, wash bin, toilet, and a few items other than a blanket. D block housed the worst inmates, such as the infamous Al Scarface Capone, George Machine Gun Kelly, and Harlem drug kingpin Ellsworth Raymond, Bumpy Johnson, to name a few. Six cells at D block's end were designated as the whole aka solitary confinement. Constructed in 1854, the original Alcatraz Lighthouse was the first lighthouse built on the U.S. West Coast and served as a navigational aid for over 50 years. The cottage-style lighthouse building was replaced by the taller 95-foot structure in 1909 when it was no longer tall enough to shine over the new cell house. So we are right on the lighthouse side of Alcatraz Island, and from here, you can see perfectly our boat. It is a little known fact that Alcatraz is a protected bird sanctuary and a significant breeding colony for four species of seabirds. However, once you step outside of the prison, it is very easy to believe since the strong smell of bird poop is nearly as inescapable as the prison itself. The Park Service has really done a wonderful job maintaining and restoring various aspects of the prison grounds. However, it was still not exactly as haunting as I was imagining it to be. But I think the lack of interpret signs, museum guides, and a subpar audio tour resulted in a somewhat disappointing experience that could have been so much better. I do think it's worth the price of admission to say you did it, but I would recommend investing in the VIP tour if you are after a more in-depth experience. So when we came to the city from Treasure Island over on the ferry, we ended up here at this ferry building which has a marketplace on the inside. And we we're just kind of like looking around and we found a mushroom shop that had like every mushroom you could imagine. And we love mushrooms, the kind you eat and cook with, not what you're thinking. Anyways. The best part about it is that it was a very affordable. We yeah. had an entire like giant bag. It was only like $5. And inside this bag is probably the equivalent of like, I don't know, four times the amount of mushrooms you, you get, get at, at the store. store. Well, $11 later, we have an obscene amount of mushrooms now. And no plastic was used. With our mushrooms in hand, we made our way back to Avocet. But after a full day of walking, we were starving. So we decided to make a pit stop for some good old fashioned San Francisco sourdough. Our search for sourdough led us to none other than Budin on the legendary Fisherman's Wharf. It was sad to see so many of the historic restaurants permanently closed due to the pandemic and the ever-increasing lease rent. But we are very glad that this staple of San Francisco culture still remains. So after a long day of walking around, we made it back to Aquatic Park to admire the view, specifically the view of our boat. And it's so cool to see our boat here with just this cityscape behind it. So I think we're going to go on a bike ride in the morning to Golden Gate Park, which is right beyond Chris, who's standing in front of me. Um, and yeah, we're going to enjoy the rest of our time in this beautiful little spot. After all of the bread we ate at lunch, I was luckily able to make a little room in my stomach for a Ghirardelli sundae, which is an absolute must if given the opportunity. And despite my lactose intolerance, it was the perfect way to end another great day.
So one of the benefits of having to pay the $10 per night Anchorage fee is that you do have a private beach now where you can bring your dinghy. This is on the National Park Service Beach, which is part of their maritime museum where they have all the wooden ships and things like that. So you do have to be respectful because this is their property, as many of you viewers are. So just make sure that you keep all of your stuff out of the way. It's really nice to come back to this because our dinghy is exactly where we left it, chained to this tree, not tampered with. So it's good to see. What are you doing, Chris? We are gonna make our exit off the beach and back to the Abbasset, but try not to hit any swimmers. There's probably 30 swimmers in the water. Which is crazy because the water's freezing. Screw that. Port. Another day, another bike ride. We were headed over to the Golden Gate Park. The 1.7 mile long Golden Gate Bridge is an icon of the San Francisco Bay Area, connecting the city of San Francisco to Marin County. At its completion in 1937, the suspension bridge was considered an engineering marvel, and at the time, it was the longest main suspension bridge span in the world. That was hard. As you can see, Carl's showing his real face today. So we can't quite see the top of the Golden Gate. But that's okay. It's the right way. Chris is going the wrong way. Uh, I figure I'm on hills to get up here. But it doesn't do bad. Definitely um, easier, honestly, than the Treasure Island to Oakland trail we did the other day. That was challenging in some areas, for sure. Made it. The bridge is named after the Golden Gate Strait, which is the entrance to the San Francisco Bay from the Pacific Ocean. The US Navy had lobbied that the bridge be painted blue and yellow stripes to increase its visibility. But when the steel arrived in San Francisco painted in a burnt red hue as primer, the consulting architect decided that the color was both highly visible and more pleasing to the eye. In 1965, a massive cleanup effort to remove all of the lead-based paint from the bridge started and continued through 1995. Today, a zinc-based primer paint is used instead. The Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District calls the zinc a sacrificial metal, something us sailors know a thing or two about. And the feeling of the whole bridge vibrating is terrifying. After our ride, we could officially say that we had sailed under, flown over, and biked across the Golden Gate Bridge. A very cool trifecta. In Aquatic Park Cove, you get to share the anchorage with these historic boats behind you, which are part of the National Park Service Maritime Museum, which is really cool because not only do you get to go and explore these ships, but you also get to see the shipwrights working on restoring them. And if you catch them at a good time, you can um, ask them questions and usually they're more than happy to talk to you and explain a little bit more about the process. So the boat behind us is actually getting new masts built and the masts that they're working on look so similar to the woodworking projects that Chris has done back down in Ventura. So it was very reminiscent of the projects that we've done on Avocet and other boats. And it's just really cool to see that that process and those techniques are still being used and practiced today because it's very important we keep history like that alive. Right now we're gonna go meet with one of the shipwrights who's actually a follower and friend of Chris and I on Avocet's social pages. And he was willing to chat with us and answer some of our questions about the Maritime Museum and shipwright projects. So we're gonna head over there, chat with him, and then we're gonna get out of here and move on to our next spot. My name is Carnell Hillscan. I work for the National Park Service. A big part of my job is to manage a crew of volunteers. And we have had as young as seven to as old as 91. And most folks come in every week. Some of them have been coming in for over 30 years. And you can volunteer 
in multiple different facets of the park service. A small craft department, boat shop, as we call it, is one. There's the riggers, and then there's uh, the shifts guys, and there's a couple of volunteers in there. They probably have the smallest number of volunteers. There's also the steam tug Hercules. They are actively trying to get the ship back to the point where they can steam under its own power, uh, which they are hoping to do soon. Us sailors know that soon is a relative word when it comes to boats, which is why Carnell isn't holding his breath. It's boat projects. So. We thoroughly enjoyed chatting with Carnell about the work he and his team are doing at the museum, especially their latest project restoring an old Monterey fishing boat from the early 1900s. But Carnell's love for boat restoration doesn't stop in the museum. He also has his own projects to focus on. I have a Choi Lee uh, Bermuda 30 uh, wood one, but I'm part of the, the group online, and I saw that you guys had posted that you were in Cooper Cove, and I was like, hey, you should come check out San Francisco Maritime National Historic Park. A colleague of mine was showing you guys around, and I walked around the corner and was like, I know these folks. Always good to see folks you know here in person and checking out really cool national park. Before we got on our way, we took one last tour around the museum to admire the carefully maintained maritime history. Aquatic Cove was good to us, it was a great place to be, and we're excited to come back. But first, we have more of the bay to explore, so we're going to get going. My least favorite part about being in the bay, at least anchoring in the bay, is that you have to deal with the gross mud that's on the ground. We were spoiled in Channel Islands by having sand, and now we have to deal with this oily poop, gross, silty mud stuff. And we don't have a wash down, so it's all done by hand. Fun. <laughs> Next on Sailing Avocet. I forgot how cold it was here. 